Hello, I'm Casey Dinges, Executive Advisor for the American Society of Civil Engineers. Thanks for joining me today as we discuss the future of infrastructure and the off-planet possibilities that may lie ahead. My guest today is Melody Yashar, Director of Building Design and Building Performance at ICON. She's also an expert, a key expert in space architecture and advanced construction technologies. Welcome, Melody. Thank you so much for having me, Casey. Now, Lydia, over the last century, technology and innovation have begun turning what was once science fiction into reality, alternative energy, autonomous vehicles, smart city applications. For civil engineers, the future of the profession means shaping the built world we live in today and tomorrow. Advanced materials such as 3D printing have transformed the construction industry. How did these materials impact infrastructure systems overall? Well, uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing as a construction technology is not only about innovative and advanced materials development, but it's also just as relevant. It also implicates uh, robotic hardware and software systems that actually deposit that material into a unified structural system and building enclosure. So one of the things that we do at ICON is develop those advanced materials in conjunction with advanced software, hardware, and robotics to create resilient, durable, and accessible housing solutions uh, available for all. So when we're talking about the future of infrastructure and how additive manufacturing has transformed the building industry, what I really see as the true value add is that 3D printing and additive manufacturing provides a unified structural and material system that is essentially a one-stop shop to introduce efficiencies in construction time, to minimize uh, the risks of um, labor shortages when it comes to construction, and, uh, and, and many other efficiencies in regards to how, uh, how little waste we actually involve in our construction processes. And uh, this type of systems level thinking relative to how a material can be transformed into a structural system in a design build manner is, is as you mentioned, going to radically revolutionize the way that infrastructure is developed in the future. That's very interesting. So what other types of high tech infrastructure solutions can we expect to see in the next five, 10 or even 25 years? Well, I like to think that smart materials will actually lead to smarter and more intelligent building systems. So the more that we are able to introduce advanced materials that provide greater benefit to how our buildings perform, the more data, once we instrument our buildings fully, the more data we'll be able to, to get about how, about the improvements that we're making to, uh, to creating an overall more sustainable environment. And based off of that, once we're at the point where we do have more, more information and more intelligence going into how building design happens, I'm hoping that that will enable us to expand outwards and lead to smarter cities that are networked in a kind of in a more intelligent um, manner so that we can not only be thinking about how a building in isolation is performing or the efficiencies that it introduces in performance in isolation, but also how it implicates an entire city or an entire area. Um, so I think that uh, the more data that we're able to acquire from our built systems, the more advanced infrastructure we're going to be seeing in the future. Why must engineers consider the possibilities of building on other planets and who else should be involved in these opportunities? So I think the reality that we're becoming an interplanetary species is, is now more real than ever. The aerospace sector has really democratized and opened up to include 
multiple industry and uh, commercial leaders that are paving the way for new transportation to space and even new habitation systems to be implemented in space. And I really think that civil and structural and other disciplines of engineers, uh, are not that I think, they're going to be critical for how these infrastructural systems, transportation systems, integrate in off-world scenarios with the other systems that we're going to need need to, to deploy to actually realize um, a, a, an initial settlement or a base on the moon or Mars. So how exactly power systems um, and, and infrastructural systems come together in addition to those that I'm thinking about in my research relative to automated construction is a huge endeavor that is going to take uh, very that is that is going to involve multi-sector innovation and collaboration to actually become real. So it's uh, it's an exciting time for engineers of all sorts to become involved. You know, we've all seen sci-fi movies about people living in outer space. What proof do we have that off-planet communities are even feasible? Right. So I, I do think that many of us default to this idea of science fiction when we think about a future of living and working in space. The reality is that today the International Space Station represents the state of the art for long duration human life in space um, with with I believe the longest, uh, well, uh, with crews living there for upwards of a year. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Apollo program, the lunar module was essentially a kind of temporary lunar habitat on the surface of the moon. And in the future, we're going to be seeing short duration stays on the moon, roughly on the order of like two weeks, and then eventually scaling those missions up to be 30 days and eventually establishing a permanent human presence. So it's certainly not going to happen all at once, but I do believe that the research um, has, 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 the research is indicating that we are on our way currently with NASA's Artemis program to realize permanent infrastructure as well as uh, eventually a permanent human presence on the moon uh, within this next decade. ASCE's Future World Vision Project examines plausible future worlds. One of those is an off-city planet depicting a version of the first colony on Mars. What fundamental elements of infrastructure are needed, especially on planets with hostile conditions? What potential risks must be considered? What a great question. Some of the most dire needs relative to uh, developing a first colony on Mars will include how do we get our power? And then from there, how do we have a sustainable resource for water for the crew or for introducing air, water, and is, uh, waste remediation? So all of these systems are at first going to be launched from Earth, um, but we have to be thinking about how we can introduce sustainable solutions for those systems to operate in the long term if we are going to actually uh, achieve and accomplish a permanent human presence again. Uh, from, the, on the, from the human perspective, some of the risks for human exploration include the risk of space radiation. So how do we protect the crew against uh, galactic cosmic rays, solar particle events, which are going to be extremely hazardous to human health. Um, and then some of the other needs are going to include, you know, how do we uh, actually achieve and realize a sustainable food resource for the crew? We certainly won't be able to launch everything from Earth indefinitely. Um, and currently, the transportation costs of, uh, of, of launching even a few kilograms to, to the moon is prohibitively expensive um, over the long term. We, we have to be thinking about renewable resources for these needs and how we're going to be um, utilizing the resources of the planet, and particularly Mars, and particularly Mars, once we arrive, so that we do have uh, again a sustainable resource for food, air, water, and um, and our power needs. How can engineers ensure humankind can not only live in this off-planet city but can thrive for generations? 
So again, I think that uh, this concept of thriving as opposed to sur surviving, uh, it, it sort of, uh, it suggests again this this idea that we need to be thinking about sustainable resources to introduce food, air, power, and breathable air for survival. Um, in a in an ideal scenario, we're not just uh, providing the minimum possible, uh, let's say, nourishment to the crew for them to withstand, you know, a two week mission or a one month mission, but we're actually thinking about all of the needs and the wants of, of actual people who would want to be living there for long durations. And that includes, you know, thinking about not only their work activities and their, uh, and, and their mission kind of performance objectives, but also what does it mean to, you know, have leisure time on Mars? And what does it mean to actually live a very thorough and uh, fulfilled life for the long term? So um, looking at not only how we're ensuring systems for, systems for the crew's survival, but also ensuring that we're thinking about the crew is in terms of, um, of their sustenance and well-being, happiness, and also self-fulfillment in the long term is going to be critical for us. Yeah, certainly. Um, in a best case scenario, we wouldn't simply relocate, but would rather expand the current built world. How would interplanetary connection and communication work? Well, um, interplanetary connection uh, is, is a challenging subject because at least for Mars operations, we're going to be operating with communications latencies and delays. And this is one of the reasons why we are so interested in and, and so committed to leveraging autonomous construction and autonomous robotic activities to realize some of the systems that we would like to, to see implemented on, on Mars. Um, so in my case, we're focusing on autonomous 3D printing and uh, additive construction to realize uh, infrastructure like landing pads, roadways, both horizontal construction, and then eventually vertical construction um, on on the Martian surface, and in, in an ideal scenario, well, not sorry. In in a future scenario, we would be doing this completely autonomously to uh, mitigate against the risks of that possibly forty four two way forty four minute two way communication latency. In a moon scenario, we're looking at a roughly two to four minute. Um, two-way communication delay latency. So it's not as bad. We're able to operate using telerobotics. But uh, one of the things that we're really aspiring towards is introducing, uh, again, intelligent robotic systems and autonomous robotic systems that can uh, mitigate against the risks of those communication delays. So distance really is an issue when it comes to that. Yes. Uh how can those currently in the profession start contributing to this new frontier of civil engineering? I think that um, many technical subcommittees within ASCE are already exploring the topic of how to develop systems in an off-world scenario. Uh, ASCE Earth and Space is a conference that recently wrapped up uh, that looks at these issues, that looks at these issues of construction in an off-world scenario. Uh, and I do believe that there is lots of room for collaboration across academics, industry to come up with new concepts and new uh, research opportunities, both when it comes to grant work and when it comes to just uh, general, I guess we could say, augmentation research relative to how we're going to realize uh, systems such as construction systems, power systems, and off-world scenarios. So I think that there's lots of room for for uh, for those who are interested to contribute. And um, there are definitely the technical groups and subcommittees who are interested in hearing from folks who want to get involved. Melody, thank you so much for joining me today for this fascinating discussion on the future of civil engineering beyond Earth. Thank you so much. For more information on ASCE's Interchange series, visit ASCE.org slash interchange.
Thanks for tuning in today, and we'll see you next time on ASCE's Interchange Live.